again, everyone. Welcome back to the Fandom Zone podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the Fandom Zone once again, ready to talk The Boys Season 2. But I'm not joined by my usual Phantom Zone partner, Jesse Jackson. Jesse, as it turns out, has burned himself out a little bit doing Set Listing Bruce podcast, like maybe three of those a week. So he hasn't really had the time to go through The Boys Season 2. So I reached out to someone I could depend on. And <laughs> so... Uh, Everyone, please, please welcome to the Phantom Zone podcast. Joining me for these next, this week and the next seven weeks as we discuss the boys season two, please welcome DJ Nick to the Phantom Zone podcast. How are you doing, hey, Nick? Hey, Charles. I'm doing wonderful. You know, thank you so much for the opportunity, you know, we're to discuss a show that I know everybody's been talking about, you know, both superhero fans, and non-superhero fans. I'm sorry, you know, that Jesse couldn't be part of the conversation because he always brings so much great insights to whatever he does. And I'll definitely try to uh, do as well, or at least, you know, my best to fill those shoes for sure. Because those Texan boots definitely need some fitting. <laughs> so I'll do my best to fill them Texan boots. Well, I think you'll do just fine, sir. And, you know, I've reached out to Jesse. I know I've extended the invitation. So if he ever gets caught up, he's more than welcome to join us here for a discussion. I think it'd be a lot of fun, the three of us, to talk to boys. But in the meantime, while we wait for Jesse to kind of get his priorities straight, man, <laughs> we're going to talk to the boys, like I said, season two. And we're going to talk here at episode 191 of the Fandom Zone. We're going to talk The Big Ride, the very first episode of The Boys Season 2, aired not too long ago on September 4th, 2020, written by Eric Kripke, who wrote the season one episodes The Name of the Game and Cherry, and he's also the showrunner of The Boys, directed by Phil Sigritia. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah. He directed the season one episode, Get Some, and I think they did a solid job, at least as far as a, a season two opener. And I'm looking forward to getting your thoughts on this, Nick. Well, I, I definitely think so, because, you know, when I had actually watched the, the whole season one, I was like, wow, you know, I'm so glad that season two is already up because I get to watch it because – um, season one was so strong. And as I mentioned before, it was so out of left field because I still don't think there's anything out there quite like the boys. I mean, I've, you know, we have also on Doom Patrol talked a little bit on Titan talk about the fact of Doom Patrol being maybe tangentially similar, but it's still different because Doom Patrol is even more comedic than, than, uh, than the boys. The boys is humor, but it has humor. But it's very, very dark. And, um, and and I just think it's just wonderful that also it gives so much social commentary as well. And the fact that superheroes are literally the villains. It's a total role reversal where the soups, as they call them, are the bad guys. And us mortals are the good guys. And it's just, it's an, a you know very new concept. And as I said, the themes they bring up ring so strong and true today as well. Yeah, I think I think it borrows from my at least from my understanding from my comics background. I think it kind of borrows a little bit from the premise of like the Earth Three Crime Syndicate. Mm. That was kind of like the evil version of the Justice League of America yeah. back in DC Comics. It kind of takes that basic concept that you know, like, what if you know the big superheroes in charge were the bad guys? And you brought up a great point. I was glad you brought it up because I was going to do that if you didn't, that it tacks on this great social commentary and it really kind of explores the concept of, well, what if superheroes were celebrities, like true yeah. celebrities, kind of like our, our, like a lot of our music stars and, and movie stars and TV stars and whatnot, you know, just that kind of, you know, that kind of media whores almost yeah. and that a lot Very of them true. are and that kind of exploration of that world and how it tends to corrupt you. And I think that's one of the central themes on top of being a superhero show. That's this weird fusion of, of all these dark themes. And on top of it, though, there's a story, an underlying story of heart in the form of Huey and Annie. There's an underlying yeah. love story there that with all this chaos going on and all the drama of, you know, Huey's group, the boys, Annie's group, the seven, 
that it's almost kind of like a almost like a Romeo and Juliet type romance going on here. Yeah, it is that kind of lost in the middle of all this chaos. Like you said, there is this room for love. I could almost compare it to I don't know if you ever heard of the famous photo of the Vancouver kiss where no, basically I haven't. It, it had happened during the Stanley Cup final between the Vancouver Canucks and the Boston Bruins and the Vancouver Canucks had lost. And so a major riot broke out in Vancouver as it wants to happen, you know, when it comes to hockey games. Hockey fans, go figure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And you have, of course, this fantastic photo. It's so perfect it could have been staged where you have people around fighting and this couple making out right in the center of it all. So that's why it kind of reminds me the nice. way you're describing it of the Vancouver a kiss because you have chaos you know overturned cars and people just beating the, the hell out of each other dogs and cats living together mass hysteria exactly <laughs> yeah and and this couple just happily making out in the midst of it all it's a beautiful photo it's very poetic <laughs> i'm gonna have to look that up that sounds great yeah. yeah this one tiny little moment of calm surrounded by this huge hurricane yeah. this, like almost like the eye of the hurricane the eye of the storm but obviously, you know, Nick has watched season one. I've watched season one. Now I'm guessing, like myself, you've probably watched all the season two episodes by now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, I, but we are going to pretend we did. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, for the for the benefit of our listeners, you know, we'll try to keep from spoiling things. I'm sure one or two things may slip in there. So apologies for that. But for the purposes of our discussion, I think it's probably best if we try to at least pretend that we don't know, or at least, you know, so that for, like I said, anybody that may be just watching the boys for the first time and, hey, maybe reached out to a podcast like The Phantom Zone and, mm -hmm. you know, was looking for that kind of supplemental material but doesn't want it spoiled ahead. So if you know what's going to happen, that's cool. We're not going to try to, you know, overlook that because, you know, like I said, we've both watched how this plays out by now. But I think it's going to be an interesting thing to talk about, you know, going yes, one, week by week. And and this is kind of Nick's suggestion because I think, if I'm not mistaken, you kind of wanted to get a little bit more of a um, – kind of get a little bit more detailed analysis than just doing – a one episode season summary or do i have that wrong no no you're correct charles also because like i said being a series i think it's good to kind of like serialize when you're doing a podcast like this you know i mean totally it's it's fine i guess you know if people do recaps but i think there's so much going on within these episodes and we're talking about episodes about an hour long per episode exactly so they're almost like short movies yeah so and I think they deserve almost to be um, – get an analysis, a separate analysis per episode because of the fact that they are so rich and there's so much going on. If it were like, you know, a 25, 30-minute episode, we could have even done a season recap because it's actually quicker. Right. But a one hour – Per episode, like I said, it's a short movie. Well, and then, like you said, there's so much going on in these episodes. Yeah. I mean, it's not a very slow-paced show by any means. Yeah. And I think that's one of the charms because of why it's kind of taken in popularity is that, you know, it, it, it does have a lot going on. It's got a lot for the audience to kind of think about and enjoy, uh, laugh at, cringe maybe a little bit here and there. Yeah over but there's always something going on and this episode this very first episode of season two no exception so with that in mind let's dive right into this we could probably just you know very quickly address the cast sure you know obviously if you've watched season one it's a lot of the same actors from season one but you know we have got the great carl urban as william billy butcher who's not a major factor in this episode but he does turn up at the end in a great reveal great return Jack Quaid plays Hugh, Huey Campbell, or as we know him in the comics, Wee Huey. Yeah. And, you know, one of the central characters, especially, like I said, with the, his, his romance with Annie January, Starlight, played, of course, by the great Aaron Moriarty, who continually seems to up her game every time she's on screen. And nobody knew she could sing, which is crazy. Yeah, one, she, yeah go ahead, if you want to talk about what, that. No, I have to first say, one, she has a killer surname, as to actually be born with a surname Moriarty. Right? How cool is that? Now, now, I don't know if she was, was she born like that, or was that a stage name? Either way, it's a great call. Yeah, I mean, look, if, if it's a real, if it's a real surname, you know, it, it's really, really cool because like, you bet that at school, she probably wasn't picked on for that surname, you know, and probably yeah. even more so in college, folks were like, oh, wow, you know, I'm a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. Are you related? I mean, did your family inspire Conan Doyle to create that character <laughs> or this kind of thing, you know, because of course, it's a very Irish surname and you, you know, being an Irishman yourself, yep. so, you know. 
she might may just very well have Irish heritage. See, I got Skaggs, and if I had gotten Moriarty, something really cool like that, I could have had like you know the nickname the Professor in college. <laughs> but no, I don't get that. I don't get anything that cool. So unless of course I change my name, but I'm not going to do that. But yeah, I'm, I'm a bit jealous over that name. It's a very cool name. And yeah, she does a she does this great song, and we'll talk about we can talk about that when we get into a little bit more of our discussion. But it's a song called. Never Truly Vanish, that appears a few times through the course of season two, without spoiling anything, even as one of the end credit songs in one of the yeah. episodes coming up. So and we'll get to that. We also had Laz Alonzo as Marvin T, a.k.a. Mother's Milk, or a.k.a. M.M., as Billy likes to call him. Tomer Capone, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is Frenchie. And this season we finally get, find out Frenchie's real name. Stay tuned for that. We won't spoil it just yet. Karen Fukuhara, who I've actually had the pleasure to meet in person oh, wow. uh, when she was doing conventions for Suicide Squad. Yeah, because she was Katana, wasn't she? Yeah, she was she? Katana in the Suicide Squad movie. So, yeah. So, Karen Fukuhara as uh, Kimiko Miyashiro, a.k.a. the female. And she thankfully gets a little bit more to do this season than she did in season one. Very happy about that. Anthony Starr. Holy crap, the Homelander. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, man, is that guy scary? If you thought the guy was like one of the, the highlights of season one, you don't haven't even seen season two yet because, uh, or maybe you have, but you know what I'm talking about. That this guy is just so, I don't want to say well, intense. I don't want intense, but I don't want to say charismatic because, I mean, in a charismatic in a villain sense, like he's such a compelling, that's the word I'm looking for, compelling villain. He's very compelling. Yeah. And there's a lot going on there, a lot psychologically behind this guy. Yeah. So essentially is like, you know, it's Superman if you, if he was psychotic, basically. With a little bit of Captain America turned dark, if you will, as well, I think. A little, a little bit, yeah. With that excessive patriotism almost, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. That, you're, I think you're probably right. It's probably like a hybrid a Superman mm. and Captain America, but a dark, psychotic version, almost. Yeah. And then we had uh, Dominique McElliot Elegant as Queen Maeve, Nathan Mitchell as Black Noir, Jesse T. Usher as A-Train, Aya Cash, who is a character to watch. She gets introduced in this episode as Stormfront. And I'm guessing yeah. Nick has one or two thoughts about Stormfront that we're going to get into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, just stay tuned for that. Chase Crawford as The Deep. Colby Minifee as Ashley Barrett, kind of taking over as the Seven's handler yeah. and uh, following the tragic death of um, uh, Madeline Stillwell at the end of season one. And does a fantastic job of being all harried and way out of her league with the Seven. Yeah. Thankfully, we got the the debut of Giancarlo Esposito as Stan Edgar. And if, yes, you've, seen, I, and if you've seen Breaking Bad or The Mandalorian. You or know, even Once Upon a Time. Or Once Upon a Time. You're right. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. You know what a great villain he is. Yeah. So and, uh, this is no exception. Fantastic job. Chantel Van Santen plays Becca Butcher, and then we have uh, Cameron Crovetti as Ryan Butcher, although they don't make their debut until next episode. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about them then. But in the meantime, so that's our cast, our, our central cast. Trivia, I got a little bit of trivia before we get into our discussion. The Big Ride, the title of this episode, is actually comes from a four-part story called The Big Ride. That was in the boys' issues number 56 through 59. And that's the Garth Ennis, Derek Robertson, and Russ Brown comic book series that was originally published by DC Comics, later published by Dynamite Entertainment. Completely different story from what's being presented oh, okay. here. So it's just basically the, the title only. In the, in the comic book story, Huey returns to the fold after he and Butcher, Butcher – are investigating a murder of a transgender sex worker that may be linked to a character of the seven we haven't seen yet, Jack from Jupiter. Oh, okay. And tensions escalate between the two groups as unknown forces may be trying to steer them into direct conflict with one another. And with the first casualties from both sides since the aftermath of 9-11 occurring as a result. So obviously this was taking place at a much different time period shortly after the events of 9-11. 
And that's something yeah. Garth Ennis um, incorporated into the boys comic. That's obviously mm-hmm. not being featured here on the TV series. But I just thought I'd mention it for anybody wondering. And also uh, a little bit, another bit of trivia in the comics, Stormfront was depicted as a male character, not a female uh-huh. character. It's another difference from the comics. Um, in this, in the comics version, Stormfront was a member of the superhero team Payback, and he was thought to be a danger due to his deep belief in Nazi ideology, of course. And it was recommended that Vought destroy him. But instead, because Vought is Vought, as we know, watching the show, they used his genetic material as the basis for experiments that would later create Homelander and Black Noir. Uh-huh. Okay. So... Uh, Stormfront, Stormfront apparently destroyed the levees and caused widespread flooding in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Again, you have oh. to kind of take into account the time period. Into context, yeah. Sure. Exactly, because Garth Ennis was trying to kind of like, well, what if these big world events or, you know, big events were taking place uh, shortly during the, at the same time in this parallel universe? Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. Yeah. And Stormfront was essentially aiming to ethnically cleanse the city and free up valuable real estate for Vought. Aha, uh-huh. I see. Yeah. So that's a little different, a <laughs> little different from the comics. And he ends up getting killed though by Butcher, Frenchie, Mother's Milk, and Love Sausage, who we see later <laughs> this season. A Russian superhero who essentially kick and curb stomp him to death. Kind of like something that happens to Stormfront later in the season, which we won't talk about just yet. So that's the differences between the comic and the, and the series. Just thought I'd mention nice. that. All right. So I thought we we could break this down into three topics. Mm-hmm. Topic number one, I think we could talk about how about we talk about the boys. And let's also talk about Starlight. Mm. And let's catch up with the boys, you know, obviously following the events of season one. Butcher's missing. And the boys are kind of having to, to fend for themselves. They're fugitives at this point. Yeah. And hiding out. We find out that uh, apparently Frenchie, they've gone underground. And they're hooked up with, like, some friends of Frenchie, some associates of Frenchie, <laughs> yeah, called the uh, Clarkson Avenue Haitian Kings. And uh, essentially they're a gang. And they are basically fund their efforts through drugs and yeah. whatnot. <laughs> so... So essentially, they're they're kind of hiding out with these guys, and uh, while trying to further their activities and keep an eye on the seven and, and avoid the law in the process. Any thoughts uh, from you, Nick, on on the boys' characters? You know, obviously Frenchie, Huey, Mother's Milk, Kimiko, and uh, how we pick up from them at this point. Well, there is definitely a lot to say. I mean, I have to admit, you know, at first, the first question on my mind initially was what the heck happened to Butcher? Because obviously we had that crazy cliffhanger at the end of season one where, you know, mm-hmm. he's introduced, he's, you know, he finds out that Becca is alive and well and that they have a son now who apparently is Homelander's son. And so it's like, what happened to that? And I was, at first I have to admit, I was a little bit shocked that they didn't go directly to where we had cut off from season one. And that you we can say mad. If you were mad, it's okay. Yeah, I was. That we didn't pick up with that. I was a little bit mad, I have to admit, because I was <laughs> like, you know, I, cause I was so sort of, um, invested in, apart from that, I was invested in, in the butcher character from the get go. And it was right. such, such a compelling way to end season one. So, it, you know, throughout the, the episode, I kept saying stuff, okay, but where is Butcher? This is all fine right. and dandy, but where is Billy, you know? Uh, but that aside, you can definitely see, I think, that our characters are, um, I mean, there's cabin fever, I think, is definitely setting in for, for most of them. They're, you know, obviously everybody um, is, there's, there's tension amongst everybody because we know Mother's Milk had to leave his girlfriend and his daughter. I don't know if he, he, she was his wife or his girlfriend. Um, I think it's his wife, if I'm not mistaken. So, so he basically... At least, at least the mother of his child, at the very least. So his baby ba- mama. He basically, yeah. yeah, had to leave her and his daughter. And of course, you know, French is cut off from, from everything. And, and Huey, I mean, is from, from back in season one, life has just gone completely a 180 on him. And he's yeah. still trying... He's still reeling, I think, also from, obviously, the whole fact of um, having to, you know, the, the liar revealed when it comes to him and, and Starlight, of course. And this is, you know, a typical thing that we have seen before. It's like, 
the guy keeps lying. It's like eventually the lies will catch up with you. And that, I was getting a little bit irked that those how long are they going to drag this on till Starlight finds out or he tells her the truth. And so, you know, we see that they are still meeting up in secret, of course, even yep. though obviously, I mean, I think they, they still love each other at this point, but obviously they're not going to, you know, make up and everything because let's, let's they're be kind honest. of afraid to address those feelings. Yeah. Cause they never, there. They, you know, in, they, I, when they, when they're in, in that scene, when they're on the subway and I think to myself, you know, my first question would be like, Huey would, if I had, had I been here, it's like, so when it comes to us, what's the situation, you know, but yeah. no, but, he doesn't but say they're still, they're still kind of estranged from one another. I think, I think Huey would obviously like to try to try to get back with, with Annie. Who wouldn't but Annie, be honest, <laughs> but, but I think Annie's still yeah, exactly right. But Annie, I think is um, still feeling a little hurt yeah. that of what Huey was keeping from her. And, um, and so she's a very guarded, although she, they at least have the lines of communication open. Yeah. So at this point, it, so at this point, at least it gives Huey something to hope for. I think so too. And we can tell he gets incredibly jealous about the fact that apparently he's been checking out her out on Instagram and seeing these photos with these celebrities and what have you. Cyber stalking her basically. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So obviously he still cares and he's, he, yeah. you know, he wants to call her and, and, um, and he feels he's lost a, you know, a big, something important in his life, obviously, because, but once again, you know, he led her on, he lied to her. And even in this episode, he continues to lie to her and he's like, I'll never lie again. And he's like, and he calls her and she's like, so what's the deal? I don't lie to me. Oh, I'm not lying. I'm not. I mean, really, either he's a pathological liar and he just can't help it. Or at this point, you think he would have learned his lesson and tell, or told her since he knows that she's on the up and up. Well, I think he just he feels conflicted because he doesn't want to endanger the others, and obviously he feels. I think if he shares everything with her, there's always the chance that the seven are going to find out. True. Even though I, I, I can't. That's, that's the dilemma. So he's 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 being guarded with her. She's being guarded with him. Yeah. And um, as a result, they're not being honest with one another. That's and that's why you think to yourself, can this relationship work? Because they, you know, right. as, as we, you know, one can say it was an almost well, at least on Annie's part. And Annie's been been on, honest with him pretty much from the get go. He really yeah. kind of hasn't. And and I see your points, but I also kind of feel really bad for Starlight because she is such a good person, and um, it just really upsets me when it when I see those yeah. kind of things. You know, because she's been lied to and. She could have taken it way worse because she could have incinerated him had she wanted pretty, to. Pretty much. And, and, and that's another concern is like, well, I don't really want to piss her off because she could completely blow me away. Right. Yeah, there is um, that so there is that. Yeah, exactly. Or throw me around the room and break every bone in my body. But, um, you know, and it's, 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 it's for me, it's a little different. It's very interesting to watch these two interact because in the comics, um, Huey and Annie, uh, they weren't really, Huey didn't tell, open up to Annie about his activities with the boys until about two thirds of the way through the comic book series. Wow. So the TV show really accelerated that. Well, I think they had to, because they had to get rid of that famous trope of yeah. the guys keep li- will keep lying. And then, you know, by halfway you know, through. And, and why, and why is Annie keep going back to him if he's. If he's constantly lying to her. Yeah, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. But um, but it also it kind of um, gets Annie uh, more involved yeah. with um, with the boys and gets them helping out. And as, as we kind of see in the course of this episode, because um, they're essentially trying to uh, get their hands on some compound V. Yeah. And um, they think this guy, this other soup named Gecko, apparently, at least Annie thinks, um, or is, I'm sorry, Huey hands Annie a picture of Gecko and says that he might be able to help get that compound V. Can you help yeah. us get that? And she's obviously not sure. Um, she apparently knew Gecko from back in the day. Um, I believe and, they performed like in a high school play, and he was Jesus. No surprise. Yeah, it's, you know, it's what, whatever Christian group she he, they were in together, almost like a Christian version of the Teen Titans, almost. I'm guessing. 
yeah. in like whatever youth group, you know, superhero youth group she was in with Gecko. And so it's just a matter of her reacquainting herself with Gecko, who in the meantime, since all those years ago, has developed a rather interesting uh, occupation, <laughs> shall we say. Well, I mean, and of course, it's totally in play in keeping with the style of the boys. You know, the man yeah. cannot keeps regrowing his limbs. So what's he going to do? He's going to cater to BDSM people who get yeah. off by, by chopping limbs off. So it doesn't yeah. it did not surprise me. I mean, but but yeah, as I said, in the boys universe, this is like, you know, run of the mill for sure. But, uh, but yeah, it apparently was... only costs you an extra grand to cut his junk off. <laughs> Where's the nearest ATM? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was a great line. <laughs> yeah, it was. I've got some others, you know, if you, if we want to talk quotes later. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, but yeah I just... it, was, it was, I'm surprised he, they didn't give him more, should we say, attention because this guy feels no pain. I granted, yeah. okay, he might not be seven material, but still. It's useful, right? Yeah. You know, like you can send him into dangerous situations and. It doesn't matter because he, if he gets chopped up, he'll just regenerate. So That's right. His, his body parts. That's Not right. like in a Doctor Who way, different way. <laughs> like a starfish kind of way. <laughs> yeah. But. Also, to, to look at the other, the other guys, I mean, uh, Mother's Milk, I, it's so endearing that he's trying to build this Vermont house. Yeah, Seeing a, doll a, ha a doll house. A doll house. Yeah. Yes. Seeing this grown man, this, you know. This big black guy, like – building you know who is like you know very formidable you know he's a he's a fighter and then you see him trying to work on this dollhouse yeah. i mean the guy's this. bicep is bigger than my head so pretty much yeah <laughs> he could crush you like a grape easily, that's yes. right and so it was kind of endearing that he is trying to build this dollhouse amidst yeah. all this craziness of <clears throat> of like guns go be you know being sold and all the other stuff I think it's almost like his happy place. I mean, I, I assume he's doing it for his daughter, but hey, he could have a hobby and just enjoy building dollhouses. You know, everybody needs a yeah. hobby, I guess. But I mean, I think that's one of the things that makes Mother's Milk so endearing as a character is that he's this big, intimidating guy when he w needs to be, mm. but he's got a much softer side to him. He's probably the most together of all the boys. Oh, I yes. Guess. He's, he's the most um, good-natured. And is more of a realist and uh, almost has like a, a little bit of a Zen approach almost, I think. Yeah, very kind of Luke Cage ish, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Luke that's Cage a, I think that's a, get along. Yeah, I think that's a good comparison because Cage was kind of that way too, a little more thoughtful soul than yeah. just, you know, than just the intimidating guy and the big intimidating guy. Yeah. And, um, and you know, all he wants to do is just get back to his wife slash girlfriend, whatever she is, and her kid and their kid. Um, so you feel for him; he's sympathetic. But but he also, you know, now with Butcher gone, he's the one have to that's left looking after the team yeah. in in Butcher's absence, and uh, and especially looking out for somebody like Huey, who is just you know he's all over the place. place. He's all over the place, and he wasn't that long ago. He was working the video, as a video store clerk. Yeah. So, so obviously very out of his depth and then in a lot some. of ways. And also, but, I uh, love the, I love the budding relationship between Frenchie and, and Kimiko. I think it's yes. so sweet. Frenchie is another one of my favorite characters, aside from just him being, you know, once again so paternal almost or brotherly. What be you know, yeah. make your pick, take your pick with Kimiko. And I just love their budding relationship and how much their trust has grown. And now Kamiko is learning, you know, to write things down. We have that mysterious message that she has written down, at, you know, which is still a mystery at this point. It's like, what yep. was Kimiko trying to say? And it's like, I love that. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's, it's beautiful. You know, once again, amidst all this yeah. chaos, you know, we have Annie and Huey and we have Kamiko and Frenchie, which is another beautiful relationship. I mean, what were your thoughts on that one? Yeah. Well, you know, it's something that, that the comics did. So I was very happy to see them develop it. That in the comics, Frenchie was essentially almost like a very protective brother mm. to Kamiko. You know, obviously a friend, but almost like a, acts like a brother. He yeah. watches out for her, makes, you know, if she, you know, if she starts to stray down a dark path, like there's one comic storyline where, um, 
she kind of goes off and starts doing to try to make money. She acts as an assassin, a hit mm. woman, and he tries to steer her away from this um, because it's not good for her. So he watches out for her, yeah. almost like a guardian yeah. in a lot of ways. But I think with Frenchie, there, I think there are some underlying, at least in the TV series, there's some underlying uh, romantic feelings as well, at least on his part. Ah, so you think it might actually be that it's becoming love, you know, or, and so it's not it's not brotherly, but it might be then be moving into another realm of yeah. affection. A little bit, at least uh, as far as, as at least as far as maybe Frenchie wants. I don't know. We don't know yet if that's what Kamiko wants. Even though we had seen her kind of, you know, doing her nails and combing her hair and, you know, granted, I'm sure she probably wants to look more respectable, possibly, right. because but secondly, she could be doing it also for, for for Frenchie's benefit. I mean, I'm not saying that she's doing it for that reason, but it could be that maybe she's yeah, like, or, you know, I want to look pretty for him. Or it's a it's a simple like that she feels comfortable, you know, secure, and then she can kind of get back to a semblance of normalcy. Yeah. After everything she's experienced, and all, and all the trauma she's endured. You're almost so. like kind of getting rid of that dirt and, and kind yeah, of blood yeah. on her hands and kind of yeah. starting anew. Yeah. Yeah. And um and also you know, we get to kind of see a little more cleaned up Karen Fukuhara as yeah. a result. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is you know, no you know, it doesn't hurt either, right? I'm sure. No, it does not. <laughs> Everybody's so, so uh, pretty in this in this show. <laughs> Far too pretty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it leaves me out completely. But <laughs> I makes, could never be on this. I could, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not good, I'm not good looking enough to be on this show, apparently. <laughs> so we had, uh, getting back to Annie, We so she goes to, she tracks down Gecko, records him in a hotel room with a customer, and essentially blackmails him. Like, hey, look, you know, you're going to need to get me this Compound V. Otherwise, I'm going to release this. It's going to go viral on all social media right. and all this kind of thing. And yeah. he's kind of horrified because, well, I thought we were friends from back in the day. And so it, it's kind of interesting that Annie, you know, already by this point, um, I think she's seen so much and experienced so much enough that it's hardening her as a person. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And making her more, more brutal. And um, she's losing that innocence that she had. Yeah, she is. A little more jaded and uh, not so naive like she was when we were first introduced to her at the beginning of season one. Yeah. So it's kind of sad to see her lose that naivete. But for the purposes of what needs to be done, you know, she she embraces that and uses that to uh, force Gecko to get her what she wants. Yeah. And and she's so excited by it. She ends up going back to Huey and telling him. Like, hey, you know, I've got this in motion. Yeah, see what I did? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, she's already like, what, quote, burn those effers down. And um, they're trying to figure out, like, um, which news outlet they need to reach out to by this point, by the episode's yeah. end. Oh, yeah, she's so. as excited as can be because maybe because she's never really had to. I mean, obviously, it's also a rush for her because she's doing something forbidden. And I have a feeling, you know, that before all this, you know, even we meant we, you know, it was mentioned that she had very much this church past and she was very sort of, you know, clean living and all this kind of thing. I'm actually surprised she hasn't developed a drinking problem at this point because of all right? the things that she's seen. Yeah, I know, right? Um you know, and, and, and as we find out later, I mean, without getting into details, it's also affecting her faith yep. as, a, as a result, which is something that's very central to her character. Now, one of the things we also see Starlight, that she's still working with the Seven. Yeah. She's still using that cover uh, to try to act like everything's OK. But even though she knows not everything's OK and she's still trying to help the boy. So it's almost like she, she's a double agent. Yeah. And at this point. She had me fooled at the beginning. I was like, wait, what? Has Starlight kind of sold her soul? You know, and then we right, find because out we kind of see, case. yeah, we see her with this big crowd. You know, they're, they're, you know, she's there with Homelander. She sings this song for Translucence funeral and she's holding hands with him and saying, yeah, this yeah. is a great guy and everything else. And I'm like, gag <laughs> and she's kind of wearing that sluttier version of her costume that yeah. they want that you know Vought and others wanted her to wear insisted on it you know to to increase her profile and make her appear more sexy and um you know not the not the version of the costume that she wants to wear yeah 
But but so she's playing the part at this point. Yeah. And we find out that through the course of the episode, no, she she's still on Team Boys at the moment, and or at the very least Team Huey. Yeah. And we'll see where that goes. Yeah. It leads down some interesting places. Let's just <laughs> right. we'll, we'll just set that there. But anything else about the boys or Starlight? No, I mean, I just, I just really like this, and that the fact that obviously you can see that there's this um, void of power that Butcher has left because yeah. everybody's like they, they see him as their leader, and I'm not saying that they are, it's like uh, you know, wildcats or herding wildcats because nobody knows what they're doing, but you can right. tell that that uh, Butcher, for all the the crazy stuff he did, had this under control and was able to be a, the leader. You know, I mean, I think Mother's Milk would be a great, you know, substitute for him, you know, if Butcher did not come back. But you can tell that they really almost need a direction at this point. Yeah. Yeah, they are. They're all kind of struggling. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they don't like direction is a great uh, description of this. They're lacking in direction. So it's finally at the end of the episode, Butcher makes his reappearance. Yeah. In in a very Carl Urban way. Of course. So uh so what did you make of Butcher's return at the end? Well, one I was I was just so happy because Carl Urban has just gone from strength to strength. Already when he was he had played e- e- Eomer in the Lord of the Rings, which was the very first time I'd actually seen him. I believe that was his breakthrough role, but because I think he was already may well known in New Zealand. But from there to being in the MCU to this, he's just so so good. I and know. Dr. McCoy on the Star Trek movies, I might add. Of course, yes. This is... he's, a, he's a very worthy successor to uh, the late, great um, DeForest Kelly, I might add. I know you're not a Star Trek fan, but I thought I'd mention it because I'll, no, well, I'll, I'll take I'm, a, that. I'm a Trek fan. Yeah. No, but I'll take that he, because, I mean, he, I know he's – He is scary good as McCoy. He's wow. really good. Well, I highly recommend it. Well, I mean, I, I don't know, as I say, whether Peter Jackson was the guy who kind of discovered yeah. him and kind of brought him to the forefront. But I think I think it at least mainstreamed him. You know, this is his big his big Lord of the Rings was his, um, Urban's big break. And then he also did things like Dread. And yeah. like you said, talking about the um, a scourge yeah, execution. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and he's just, he's fantastic. I know folks had problems with his accent because they're like, what is he going for? Is he going for a New Zealand accent? Is he going for a British accent? Now, I actually want to ask you this, Charles. In the comics, is Butcher a Brit? Yes, he is. Okay. And and, and it's almost like a a Cockney accent. Okay. So it it kind of fits a little bit. Right. Yeah, because. Or or at least maybe a Liverpool accent a bit. So it's somewhere in there that he's he's found his his ex. So yeah, so um, Butcher is supposed to be British. Okay, yeah, because I know folks were kind of lost with his accent because they said, yeah. "What's he actually doing?" Because you know he does slip into his native New Zealand accent. I don't it have creeps, a problem with that. It creeps in every so often, yeah. But you know what? It doesn't bother me. You know, it's not. You know, once again to bring it up, he's not Dick Van Dyke doing a terrible <laughs> British accent and failing miserably. Here, it's just his thing, you know, and plus, we don't know um, Butcher's origins. For all we know, he could have been from New Zealand, moved to the UK, and has kept <laughs> some of his accent. I'm going with that. That's my headcanon. Um, well, you know, the, the TV show could make a change, I'm sure, but if they wanted to. Yeah. Wouldn't well, be the first time, right? So Exactly. No, but outside of that, you know, to, to bring it back to this, I was just so happy when he came back. And obviously, just like the boys, I had so many questions. It's like, where <laughs> were you? What? And in fact, what are you wearing? And all this kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but of course, you know, we, we do get the answer for that later down the line. But yeah, I was always happy to see him. And, uh, you know, I, he's, I think he's ready to get the band going and, you know, going places and in the, back into the right direction. Well, and obviously, Butcher feels that, well, he's the only one that can really lead the team. Yeah, he may have faith in Mother's Milk, but I think I'm sure he feels, at least Butcher feels, that nobody can do it better than he does. He feels this is his baby. Well, and he's also a bit of a control freak in that yeah. regard. I think. <laughs> yes, it, it, that's that is definitely the case. He wants to be the guy calling the shots. That's right. Yeah, he he likes it. I mean, I guess he's like the obviously the opposite to to Homelander, who is definitely another one who's very power hungry. I'm right. not saying that Butcher is as power hungry, but maybe the two are not so different. And that's a very good observation. They are very much two sides of the same coin. And uh, we'll see more of that, I'm sure, mm-hmm. as the series progresses. Yeah. So, 
All right. Uh, let's move on. Topic number two. This can be probably a pretty quick topic. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's talk about the Church of the Collective. Okay. So let's talk about the Deep. We can talk about Eagle the Archer and uh, Carol Mannheim and the introduction of this concept where the Deep is struggling. And we'll talk, we can talk about that here in a minute. But he ends up hooking up or at least getting recruited by the Church of the Collective, which is a pretty obvious uh, take on Scientology, Church yeah. of Scientology. That's right. And uh, as far as how they 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 bring him in and and uh, and end up um, converting him to their cause. Yeah. So um, we pick up with a deep uh, in Sandusky, Ohio. Is that a uh, real place? St- that is a real place. That is where, that is the home of uh, the Cedar Point Amusement Park, one of the the biggest amusement parks in the in America. Is it true that nothing ever happens? <laughs> pretty much, except for the amusement park. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's 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 basically like very Sandusky is very north northwest Ohio, right? Like right there on the right up there by um, Lake Michigan. Okay, so. Yeah, well, thank like, you for explaining that for the benefit yeah. of the Europeans out there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know it's it's. Yeah, if you if you if you look up Ohio, the state of Ohio, on and uh, and on a map or whatever, you and if you want to find Sandusky, it's very north northwest okay. Ohio, okay. right there on the along the border of Michigan. All right, but um, but yeah, nothing happens there. It's and it's basically we find you know the deep was um, almost exiled to. Yeah. Uh, be after getting kicked out of the seven, and he's not taking things very well no. because he's watching the funeral of um, his former teammate Translucent on TV, and they show pictures of various seven members, and one of the pictures of Translucent has cut off the deep. From yeah, he's been photo. airbrushed out of the photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or like I, I think they cropped it out of him or something. But yeah, he's like, he's like that's my shoulder. <laughs> exactly. You know, at first he was getting all emotional about the funeral, about translucent dying. Then he gets all pissed off, and he like really lashes out, um, starts tearing things up, and ends up getting busted by the popos as a result by the police, and he ends up in the slammer, and th- it's there. That uh, he gets recruited, and if, just as he happens to be at his lowest point. So, uh, so what did you make of the introduction of the Church of the Collective into this um, into this series? Well, you know, like you said, the first thing that came into mind when I saw this was I was either Scientology or, of course, a cult. You know, so that's that's what we're we're dealing with. So, um, it was or D all the above. Exactly. All the above. Exactly. Um, but uh, but uh, it was it, I, I, it didn't have me asking questions like what is the bigger picture when it comes to this group of people? Because, I mean, I don't know if they at first they're just in the business of set of saving souls or there's more to it. So that's that's what is often one asks when it comes to these kind of organizations. And and of course, you know, we did get introduced to this, should we say, um, take on Hawkeye or Green Arrow. Take your yes. take your pick. Right. Eagle the Archer, I have to – Eagle, Hawkeye, I got to think it's more the the boys' version of Hawkeye. Yeah, not to mention the colors were more towards purple, kind of. Yeah, right. So there was like the the, the uh, Hawkeye comics, at least Hawkeye, the Hawkeye costume in the comics. But that said, it was – yeah, it was just so unner- – it was unnerving. And it's like, yeah, I know what's happening here because they're either going to ask him if he's found Jesus or they're going to ask him something along these lines. So. Right. Right. You know, I mean, no disrespect to folks who, who follow these kind of these kind of beliefs. But, you know, that's that's the way it goes. Um, but and ever since then, folks have never knocked on my door. So I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, yeah, it was... well, I, I kind of knew something was up with these guys from the get go, because for one thing, the the Eagle, the Archer kind of like when when after bringing um, the deep uh, back to his his place, you know, and he starts chatting him up and, and goes, well, everybody's been at their rock bottom point. And you're like, ah, oh, I see where you're going with this. And he's like, hey, do you want a fresca? 
And for those who don't know, especially people like Nick that are overseas. I was going, thank you, Charles. See, you read my mind. Enlighten me. What is Fresca? All right. So Fresca, for the, for the uninitiated, is a very disappointing soft drink. It is <laughs> – it's, it's made by the Coca-Cola company, but it's a very unpopular drink. It's not it's not the type of drink that gets served in restaurants or in you know soda vending machines. It's not even a club soda. It's it's you know like um you know like the 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 most popular you know like if you had Sprite. Right. Or Sierra Mist or 7 Up, some of the more popular uncola drinks. The Fresca is like pretty much at, the, at rock bottom, just like the Deep is. You know, it's <laughs> hardly anybody knows about it, let alone drinks it. Oh. It's available in stores, but nobody buys it. <laughs> <laughs> and you wonder why they still store it in, in their shops. Right. Unless it's good for, good for a mixed drink, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The only thing I can think of is that the, the company still makes it just to hold on to the trademark or something. Oh, okay. But but um, so it's very – it was very odd to see them like, you know, p- like handing the deep – you know, like, hey, you want a Fresca and making a big deal about that. Yeah. And it's something that plays – it's kind of becomes a recurring gag throughout right. season two. But um, so for anybody wondering, that's the deal. So so right away I knew these people were weird just because of <laughs> of embracing Fresca. That nobody like at least a Dr. Pepper, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> no too exciting. <laughs> it's like, what, was Mountain Dew busy? What's up with that? So in case anybody's wondering what the deal is with that. All right. They also hand him – a book as, as the deep is introduced to this woman named Carol Mannheim, mm. who is kind of like the, the, the public relations a bit of the, of this church and hand him a very sign, like almost like a very Dianetics book. If you're at all familiar with Dianetics, the, the L Ron Hubbard book that became the basis for Scientology that. Yeah. And so in the cover mock-up is very Dianetics looking, so, so the um, the satire is is pretty dead on here, mm-hmm. and um, the the so it's a, it's kind of an introduction. So essentially, they're cr- trying to recruit Deep, who's someone they see that they can use, and mm-hmm. and uh, so the question is, um, you you kind of saw how the season played out, so it's it's a little hard to get into like, well, what did you think of was what was going to happen. What did you think of at least the concept that of Scientology kind of like trying to recruit celebrities to advance their cause, trying to go for someone vulnerable like the Deep is at this point to use him for their cause? Yeah, where have we seen that before? I know in our reality. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> no, it was – it was. I mean but that's obviously what – you know, once again, what a cult does, it takes the yeah. disenfranchised, it takes those who are down on their luck, those the who are morally yeah. weaker, who right. are not, because you're not going to go to somebody who feels super confident and who's all about, you know, strong in themselves. You're going to go with people who are astray and once again, need direction and you provide that direction. That's the basis of, of the it way a cult works. It can be manipulated works. as a result. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, you, oh, you, you know, can, you can mold them to your own ends. That's right. So it makes sense uh, that, that it would happen. And, you know, and obviously when we got to see this, I'm, I, that's why I thought to myself, what is their end game? What are they trying to achieve with um, the deep? Obviously, you know, we're not going to go into that. But it was just yeah. like that was my the main question on my mind. And at first, the deep is a little bit reticent of wanting to even be a part of this. He's like, "What the hell is going on?" And all this kind of thing, because he finds himself asleep on his couch on, on the guy's couch. I believe right. apparently he'd gotten seriously hammered the night before. Or right. Did he, he got drunk. He got drunk and and passed out. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Um, maybe he was kind of helped to be a little bit unconscious in mm-hmm. that regard. That's right, you know. But uh, but so that was that was uh, that was my other thing and yes, he seems at first obviously he's like reluctant to do to have anything to do with these people, but you know slowly but surely they kind of work their way with uh, on on him and I don't still don't know how to feel out about the deep even after all this because part of me still hates him for being so awful to women and and just you right. know abusing them, especially part- to Starlight. That's right. And we know that he's done this before. She's not yeah. the first that he's done this to. 
the other part of me is like, okay, he's getting a taste of his own medicine, which he had gotten during the course of season one. That was brutal to watch, even though you know it's gills, but it was still brutal to watch because it was so violent. Right. Um, and and so you think he's gotten a taste of his own medicine? Has you know is he redeemable? I think everybody is redeemable at, if they you know it, with given the right direction, the right people. And I think he could be a redeemable character. Um, but yeah, outside of that, it's just like you wonder where he, where somebody who's so low as he is, where they're going to go with him. Because they're even promising him they'll get him back into the Seven, which we know is what he wants more than anything else. Right, and they're using that. They're, they're using that. As, they're basically dangling the carrot yeah. and uh, trying to get him to the deep to do what they want. Like with that as the goal. Yeah. So like if you do what we say, we'll help you get what you want. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts on the deep? I mean, do you have any sympathy for this character? I don't really have any sympathy for him, but, um, but I think right now he's just more interesting to watch. You know, mm-hmm. he's, you know, he's watching him go through these struggles and it's kind of interesting that they get that they're making a point of showing him. Like they, this could have been a character that could have been easily forgotten at the end of season one. We never had to really see him again, but obviously they they have a there's something they want to do with this character, yeah. and uh, and uh, and we'll see how that plays out. Somebody must have had a serious grudge towards Aquaman, yeah. seriously. Yeah, <laughs> well, that would be Garth Ennis because he when he created the Deep, but yeah. <laughs> uh, a little different, a little different there in the comics, but um, but yeah, it was. Yeah, just you can tell the guy does not like Aquaman. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, or at least you know, think doesn't think much of him as a character at the very least. Yeah, but we'll see. He's no Jason Momoa. Let's put it that way. <laughs> all right. Um, anything else before we move on? No, I, I think that, I think that pretty much covers it. And like you said, okay. we will definitely be watching the deep with definitely with interest. All right. So uh, third and final topic. Let's talk about the seven. Uh-huh. Um, our various room. This is the big one, so I thought I'd save that for the end. So we need to talk about. Obviously, we need to talk about Homelander. We need to talk about Stormfront, yeah. who makes her debut as a member of the seven, much to Homelander's chagrin. And we also need to talk about. We can talk about Stan Edgar because, hey, Homelander, because he's not so happy with Stormfront uh, being assigned to the team without his approval, has a little chat with Stan. As yeah. it turns out, and and we can also talk about Ashley Barrett, um, the handler for the Seven, who's keeps trying to hold this team together despite um, someone like Homelander um, exerting his control over this yeah. group and and really dominating her, especially um, when Ashley tries to bring a prospective member of the Seven a guy named Blindspot in to meet Homelander thinking, Hey, it'll go well because Hey, Blindspot would be great for our image because he's visually impaired and a visually impaired superhero would be perfect. Right. Homelander doesn't see it that way. So, so what are your thoughts about our, our, our big bads this episode? Well, first off, I have to say I'm a huge, huge, huge daredevil fan. And I right. saw, obviously, I was like, yeah, okay, this is a take on Daredevil. Um, exactly. But, and uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, this is kind of cool and kind of neat. And then, you know, Homelander, boom, you know, breaks his, he smashes his is eardrums. It- and, and and I was like, oh, dude, really? I mean, is there anything you won't do? You have to be really an ass in everything. Um and I yes, felt so, yes, he does. <laughs> I felt so bad because, like I said, I love Daredevil, and this was kind of my yeah. version of Daredevil in this universe. And but then it made me think: what if somebody did this to Daredevil as well? He'd be dead immediately. So right. it, it got me thinking about: see, supervillains, this is how you ca- you take care of Daredevil. Um, but but uh, other than that, uh, yeah, Homelander never ceases to amaze me. And funny enough, in Italian, his name is Patriota, which is the Patriot, which is a curious translation if you think about it. Because granted, you know, you say Homelander, I guess it could – you couldn't really consider it a synonym of Patriot. I don't know. I mean, it seems odd right. to me as a synonym. Or that they choose the name Patriot for in, in, in Italian. I think that was the closest term they could find. 
But it really highlights, I think, the fascist side of patriotism. And that's maybe why they chose the name Patriot to, as his Italian, um, in, in his Italian name. Um, okay. But yeah. So, just, like, so like patriotism taken to excess. Yeah, when it, when it becomes, it, it goes into nationalism. Extremes. And hence, yeah, yeah. Extreme nationalism, if you will. But yeah, I just yeah. wanted to sort of share that little bit of trivia with the listeners, you know, that uh, in right. Italian, Folks like to um, like to t- take their liberties with certain character names, but uh, how, yeah. I learned something today. <laughs> I hope everybody else out did out there as well. <laughs> but yeah, outside of that, we, this character is so multifaceted because on one side he's like you know the the big bully, uh, dare I say, um, reminiscent of a certain man in the White House a little bit, but mm, for certain things bit, that he does. A little bit. Little um, bit. But uh, other than that, we see that he also is te- incredibly disturbed. I mean, when he goes into the fridge and takes out the milk. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. So, oh. so we can, just to kind of set this table a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, so Homelander, as we saw in season one, kind of had this fetish arrangement with Madeline Stilwell, yeah. the uh, Seven's previous handler. And uh, as a result, we find we learned that Homelander has a, a fetish for breast milk. Yeah. And because of this... He he starts walking, and he, remember, Homelander was the one who killed Madeline, and framing the boy, you know, Butcher especially for the for the crime to mm-hmm. cover it up. But he still had feelings for Madeline, as it turns out. And um, he goes into her office, kind of just looks around at the the you know the the office of the woman that he had killed, and even though he had supposedly cared for. And he opens up a mini fridge and pulls out that bottle of breast milk. Yeah, I was like, don't do it. it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, first he heats it. He heats it up with his heat vision to make it to make it room temperature, I guess. And uh, then he kind of like dabs his tongue, you know, just like a little taste to see if it's uh, the right temperature, I guess. He almost laps it up like a cat at first would. Right, exactly. Yeah, so he he kind of like yeah, just a the little bit on the tongue, the tip of the tongue, and then he then he starts like, okay, I'm going for this, and Gag. downs the whole but downs the whole bottle just as Ashley walks into the room, catching him in the process. Yeah, good thing I was just having popcorn at the time because seriously, I, like <laughs> I would have been sick. Seriously. That's just milk. It's nutrients, right? Right. Yeah, but. I don't know. Maybe, I know. I'm, maybe yeah. I'm maybe I'm more sque- you know what I don't mind blood and guts when it comes to those kind of things. It will make me kind of a little bit squeamish. But I'll maybe you watch bit- Hellraiser movies for crying out loud. <laughs> yeah, but you don't have people. You know, whatever. But we'll, we'll get into into the yeah. things that Nick. Would it, would it, if a, if a Cenobite did it, you know, would that make it okay? Or it, no, it would if, just if, be, uh, if like Pinhead if like Pinhead down a, a bottle of breast milk would that make it okay? <laughs> it would be awful. It would be awful. But uh, but no, it was it was just like. That was terrible. And, but yeah, it shows you what a crazy character he is. And, you know, you were mentioning, of course, that now Ashley has become the – literally the vice president of Vought at this point. Um, yeah. Obviously because she's somebody that Homelander knows he can intimidate. And it's – I guess because obviously he can't take over Vault, or rather can't be made vice president. So he's right. using – she's his puppet, obviously. So um, – because she's terrified of him. And she – you know, whatever he says goes and – so, so obviously, that's obviously, I suppose, why he chose her because she knows he knew she was so insecure and so kind of terrified, and he would never be able to pull something like this on um, on the previous vice president, and Madeline. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's you know, it's, you know, it's, you know she, and she's you know, I was just going to say that Ashley, you know, she's towing that company line, trying to push you know a character like Blindspot into the team, and Homelander exerting his control. And showing again his his authority over the situation, intimidation uh, intimidates her, and by shocking her, and you know just to just to kind of sh- prove that he can do you know just to kind of um, you know he does something shocking so that uh, to snap her into line and like well if I could do it to this guy I could easily do that to you too. 
if you if you don't go along with what I want. I don't care what the company wants. Yeah. Even during the focus group, when they're thinking of the name, what do we do? Go with super villains, super terrorists, etc. There's a whole focus group about it, which is typical right. in any company in marketing. And she, you know, doesn't obviously get a say at all because he starts whispering at her and looking at her and stuff and bullying her psychologically. And yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, it's literally mobbing in that case. You know, it's mobbing plain and simple. Um, but, and so it's, it's, yeah, he's ostensibly become the vice president of Vought indirectly. Yeah. And so, um, so it, he's obviously then he gets thrown for a big loop when, they're apparently making a, a, a movie called um, what is it like the 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 origin of the seven or something like that. Yeah, you know, well, the, it's, the, it's like on this military military backdrop, and they're doing them with the soldiers. I thought it was like a like commercial yeah. for for the military. Oh, that's that's what it was. They haven't done the movie yet. That's right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, it's, it was a like some kind of Save America campaign or something. Yeah, yeah. In order to get the seven yeah. into that's the, right. uh, the army. Yeah. Because yeah, because they're trying to uh, you know push the agenda that um, they want um, Vought to um, they want to militarize superheroes. Yeah, and so the, so they're pushing this agenda. You're right. They're, they're filming this commercial, and Stormfront just happens to show up on the set. Yeah, you know, and and she's appears to be very media savvy. She's got her cell phone and she's talking to her followers. Very influencer like. Exactly, exactly. Like, you know, she's she's live streaming whatever she's doing. And she kind of like live streams going up to Homelander and introducing herself, like, hey, I'm Stormfront. I'm the new member of the seven. And Homelander just kind of glares at her. Like, you're who? Like, who is this? And, and then he smiles at her. And you know that when Homelander is smiling at you, it's never good news. No, not at all. Not at all. And and, and the guy who plays him, Anthony, um, Anthony uh, Starr, that should be easy to remember, right? Anthony <laughs> Starr, um, he's so good. He's so uh, mesmerizing as Homelander. You know? And you see like a billion things going on behind these psychotic eyes. Mm. Uh, just in his his facial expressions and his 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 body language, and uh, it's just really fascinating to watch for me. I believe he was actually at one point opted to play Captain America at one point before Chris Evans got the parts, and he would have done well. But I mean, it would have been very. very There's good. no Chris Evans though. No, this is true, and I yeah. so, you know role reversal. I could not have seen Chris Evans do Homelander. You know, same thing. It's just this is uh, true. But but yeah, apparently. And Chris think, Evans has done played bad guys before. Yes, he has. Yes, he has, of course. But uh, yeah. but uh, but you know, as I said, it's apparently I think he had actually auditioned for for the role of Captain America before he got this. So that's it's uh, it's interesting to to and maybe he's he's pulling that off a little bit of what he had kind of done to kind of study for the role of Captain America. Right. Maybe. maybe, or at least doing like what he thought would be a bad guy version of that. Yeah. 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 Um. But uh, but so Homelander not very happy about this, and he he's decides to pay a little visit to Stan Edgar, mm -hmm. the, the head of Vought, and um, he basically says, "Look, uh, Stan, I thought I was going to get consulted on any new additions to the group, and acting like, well, hey, you know, I wasn't consulted, so you know, I've been kind of thinking that." You know, when my contract ends, maybe I'll take my talents elsewhere. Yeah. And trying to use that as some kind of negotiating leverage. Yeah. And he it doesn't he doesn't get the desired effect. <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because um, Stan explains to Homelander that apparently Homelander thinks they're like a, a superhero company when in fact they're just a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. and Homelander is just their most valuable asset. Yeah. And, or, you know, I'm sorry, Homelander is not their most valuable. It's Compound V that's their most valuable. That's right. Asset. That's their most valuable. So product. that's what I was trying to think. And so, so Homelander, you know, essentially is being put in this place here going, look, you know, all we care about is Compound V. We don't care about you. Yeah. Um, you're replaceable as far as Vaught is concerned. That's right. 
And that's obviously something that doesn't go over well, especially when you take into fact into account his psychosis yeah. and his ability, his um, need for control. And also, he's and, never not used to taking to being set to, you know told no. He is exactly. just not used to it. Yeah, that's the the that spoiled, petulant child that exists with, within this Superman like body. Yeah, and. Um, and so, uh, so he gets frustrated and um, flies off to Becca's house and uh, to go see his son, and that's where we leave him. That's right. Yeah, and I was so glad that you know that um, the actress who played Patty Spirit in the in the Flash, uh, you know, is Chantel in the, Van Santen. Yeah, yeah. Her, who, by the way, her character was still criminally cut from that show because she was an excellent Patty Spirit. So I'm just saying, but uh, that's yeah. just, that's well, just they, me. Well, they, they just came out uh, with a news article about that. Interesting that you brought this up. Uh, apparently, Chantal Van Setten kind of hinted that um, the reason she was uh, not brought back on The Flash and written out of the show was because of um, – Executive producer Andrew Kreisberg, who was at the, with the show at that one time, but had later um, fell into various accusations of sexual harassment. Once again, and yeah. it was yeah, it was essentially kicked off the show, and so it kind of sounds like maybe she experienced something to that effect. We don't um, know exactly what, mm. But apparently she and Kreisberg didn't get along at the very least. Mm -hmm. And Kreisberg used his power as executive producer to get her off the show. Mm. No, which is that, which is criminal because because Chantel is a wonderful, wonderful actress. Right. And uh, but I'm so yeah. glad that she she got this. She was saying new superhero lease on life in the boys. So that was that was fantastic. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that she would find work because she's a great actress. So no surprise. Right. Um I don't course, know why they couldn't just bring Patty back if they wanted to. Well, I mean, but, her, now, but, the, but now that Barry's with Iris, I guess is there really a point? Yeah, you know, exactly. That that storyline I think is gone for now, yeah. at least. Sorry about oh. the flash digression, but it's Nick and I. And, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's going to happen sooner or later because we're both big Flash fans. Yeah. Speaking of, of actually of um of that, you know, to bring up the whole thing of the 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 president of Vought up again. The yeah. fact that we find out that it was kind of pretty much uh, the the company was founded through the experiments of a Nazi scientist. I thought that, you know, that was big, man. I mean, I was like, right. And and yeah, the whole thing of you know, and it's obviously a um, a hint, not a hint, but a not a well. I guess it's it's almost like a criticism on Project Paperclip. Where of course Nazi scientists were being uh, scooped up by the Allies, regardless of their terrible crimes. I'm looking at you, right. Klaus Barbie, um, and folks of this <laughs> nature. Um, but, See, I told you you'd have a couple of thoughts about this. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you, you bring in Nazis, of course. You know, as as you 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 know you uh, quoted Indiana Jones, you know, Nazis. I hate these guys. <laughs> I hate these guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. I thought it was interesting that they gave us the fact that maybe it's a criticism towards, you know, one project paperclip and to the fact that a lot of pharmaceutical companies or pharmaceutical breakthroughs came at the expense of human beings. Right. And Nazi scientists like that ended up getting a pass from our government because all we cared about were, you know, the the ends, you know, the end, you know how they say the ends justify the means and beating the commies and everything, of course. Exactly. That whole race in. It started off obviously in World War II when we could, we were so desperate for the atomic bomb yeah. that we brought in scientists like you know Albert Einstein you know thankfully not a Nazi as far as we know <laughs> you know until history proves us otherwise but you know that we were so desperate to get to achieve that and the boys here makes use of that that Nazi science being the foundations for Compound V and therefore the Seven and therefore Homelander yeah. and Stormfront. Needless to say, has a very important historical part to play in this story. Yeah. As a result, in fact, it will tie in nicely to that uh, to the origins that we got of Vault Industries. So yes, but to be continued on that one. Yes. So we'll leave that there because we've already talked enough as it is. So you probably are like, okay, you know, you guys need to save some of that for other episodes, right? <laughs> All right. So um, I don't know if you have any favorite quotes. I did have a couple, and it's it's. Got, you, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have anything else before we get started? I didn't no, mean to, I mean 
the move no, on. No, 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 no. Um, all in all, I said just a great start to a second season. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, you know, as we said, it's a, this is an hour long episode, so we had to talk. We had to talk quite a bit about it. So yeah, we yeah we did. It's not like a you know kind of flash thing. There's so there's there's tons of things to talk about. So yes, wonderful, wonderful start. And I was ready for season for episode two to load up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just throw out a couple of quotes here for, for the sake sure. of time. Uh, just a couple of ones that kind of stuck in my head. Mother's Milk saying, and I'm going to you know, clean this up for, the, for Southgate Media Group. If you're the effing reason why I can't finish that Vermont country dollhouse, I will effing end you. Love that one. Yeah, I had that one on my list too. That was a good one. And then Huey talking with Frenchie, where Huey is discussing his role in the group. And he's like, so maybe I can't be Lee Marvin. But it can be Harry Potter or, you know, John Connor or 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 what's her name from the Hunger Games? And Frenchie says Katniss. <laughs> Huey's like, yeah. The point is, I could be that person who nobody thinks is awesome, but it turns out they're kind of effing awesome. <laughs> I love that. And plus, of course, <clears throat> all the, 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 the mainstream pop culture references, you know, I, I knew you had to do that. You know, you being one of the masters of pop culture references, you know. I can only I, – I say I'm number two on that regard. I say number one becomes a certain Zan Sprouse in mm-hmm. that regard. Who, who will definitely be mentioned here shortly as well. Yes, she will. Uh, yes, she will. Um, yeah, you know, when it comes to, to quotes, I just had a quick one myself between Huey and Mother's Milk. Huey is saying – so we're saying that Bort may have just assassinated the deputy director of the CIA. Mother's Milk, and now we're in the middle of that too. Happy now, Mother Trucker. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. Yeah, that was good. Uh, Gecko also had a pretty good line real quick. Uh, Pontius Pilate and Mary hooking up. Sacrilicious. <laughs> nice. Oh, yes. And we did get the head of the CIA's uh, head being exploding, by the way, just to mention that, folks. Yeah, we didn't talk about that, but not the last time we see some heads exploding. Just got to yeah. point that there. Yeah. yeah. So stay tuned for that. Keep that in the back of your head uh, as we talk more episodes. All right. What's your rating for this one? I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. A 9 out of 10 exploding heads. Oh, you really like this one. Yes, indeedy. Yeah. I thought it was a strong opening, but having seen the rest of the season, I know there's stronger episodes. So I'm only going to give this one 8.5 out of 10 bottles of breast milk. Okay. You had to go there. (laughs) <laughs> it was either that or cans of Fresca, so. <laughs> Fine. It works, it works, I guess. So I'm only slightly under you, but yeah, bottles of breast milk. So drink up, kids. All right. Jeez. I know. I don't have any Phantom Zone news because we've been off for a while, and there hasn't really been that much in the way of news, apart from just that got some great news that Sandman, the TV series, the Netflix series has started production. No, yeah, I can't wait for that. That's going to be epic at least i hope it will be i certainly hope so and yeah it's great it was great news that uh, mm-hmm. finally finally it's being filmed so hopefully worth the wait and hopefully this year we'll get one division hopefully they say coming soon or coming this year <laughs> they were thinking november but um apparently they came up with like a november promo for disney plus and one division was not part of that. I'm still holding out hope. They they still say 2020, so probably December mm. we'll get it. Which that actually would be nice. You know, the holidays will be around, and that'll be a good time to get some eyes on it. I think yeah, for sure. So, especially since there's not going to be much else in the way of programming, especially superhero TV programming around the holidays. 2021 and 2022 are going to be packed. Seriously. January is going to be huge. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be very very busy here in the Phantom Zone. Just saying. But for right now, we're talking boys, and that's okay. Didn't get any uh, mail. I, I put a little feeler out for everybody. If they want to write in and share your thoughts about the boys as we discuss these episodes. So if you'd like to uh, write in, uh, we'd be more than happy to read your letters here on the podcast. We'd definitely appreciate that, as we do for all of the podcasts that I do and Nick does. Phantom Zone fan mail, please reach out to us at phantomzonecast at gmail.com. That's phantomzonecast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Twitter at Fandom Zone Cast on Twitter, Facebook, the Fandom Zone Podcast, or Instagram at Fandom Zone Podcast. We definitely appreciate it if you did, because obviously we'd love to uh, spread our discussions of the boys around, get more um, listeners, more downloads, 
and entertain more people in the process. Mm-hmm. And Nick, how about you? Where can they find your fine work? Sir? Well, for, for brevity's sake, for you country fans out there, I do host the Whiskey and Cigarettes show where we play today's country, traditional country, and everything else in between. For more about that and where to tune in, you can visit our website. That's whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. Podcast-wise, if superheroes are your jam, or superhero movies, I should say, even psychotic ones, I do host Happiness and Darkness, <laughs> the superhero movie podcast where we discuss superheroes from superhero movies from marvel dc dark horse image and more to join us to discuss superhero movie of your choice you can follow us on instagram twitter and facebook and shoot us an email at happiness and darkness how at gmail.com and of course gold standard the oscars movie podcast where with co-hosts zan sprouse the aforementioned wonderful zan sprouse yay. <laughs> in, yes yay indeed and rachel friend from our good, good friends at the, at the five-ish fangirls we are discussing all the movies that won the oscar for best picture from 1927's wings to the present day to get in the conversation discuss your favorite oscar winner feel free to shoot us an email at goldstandardoscars at gmail.com and you can also follow us on facebook and twitter what about you charles Oh, nicely done, sir. All right. As for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio on Facebook, if you'd like to reach me out there. And, of course, my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on the Phantom Zone podcast, all kinds of comic book TV show news, comics news, TV news. News and my other podcasts that I do for Southgate Media Group, including Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast that I do with Jesse Jackson and assorted special guest companions like a certain DJ Nick, where we talk Doctor Who, Torchwood, the Sarah Jane Adventures, and more. And then also Titan Talk, the Titans podcast that Nick and I finished up here not too long ago, where we discussed Doom Patrol Season Mm 2. And as we eagerly await Titans Season 3, whenever that appears in 2021, fingers crossed, on HBO Max now, as they're shuttering DC Universe, so at least as far as um, comic book TV goes. And then Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast with, hey, that aforementioned Zan Sprouse that all the cool kids are talking about these days, where Zan and I talk, of course, Twin Peaks. We talk about David Lynch on Ghostwood, and currently we are wrapping up. We'll be doing the sixth of our six-part series of Twin Peaks actors who have appeared on the X-Files, and we're going to be wrapping up with a certain Richard Bamer, who played Benjamin Horn on Twin Peaks, and he is going to be, in the, our last X-Files episode, we're going to be discussing Sanguinarium, from the fourth season of the X-Files. So hope everybody checks that out. Our X-Files discussions, I think, have been pretty well regarded by our listeners. They've been very well received. Uh, They've been a lot of fun, and everybody seems to be enjoying them. And I'm kind of going to be a little sad to see them go. But uh, obviously, we're going to talk about some more things on Ghostwood. And once we wrap up the X-Files, we're probably going to be discussing David Lynch's film, The Elephant Man. And we'll be discussing the new Criterion Collection release that just came out last month. So uh, we'll be right on top of that one. Perfect timing and great one for the uh, Halloween season here in the States. See, you couldn't have planned it any better. (laughs) I love it when a plan comes together, to quote a certain John Hannibal Smith (laughs) from the A-Team. All right. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. Nick, thank you for agreeing to discuss The Boys Season 2 with me. I really appreciate it, especially since, you know, Titan Talk's been on hiatus and kind of give us another thing to do together. So uh, I'm really appreciative of you agreeing to do this, and I'm really going to enjoy these next seven weeks. Oh, you and me both, Charles. You know, thank you. I mean, granted, I didn't need much persuading. Let's be honest, folks. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you know, a good friend. I was, I was trying to make it sound more important. <laughs> well, you know what? A good like a bigger fr- deal. A good friend of yours contacts you and says, hey, do you want to discuss the boys? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to say? Of course you're going to say yes. Um, but yeah, no, thank you again, Charles, for the opportunity. Really excited for these next uh, next seven episodes for sure. And uh, it's going to be a fun ride. So, um, Nick, thank you again. Everybody, I hope you guys enjoyed our discussion. Come on back next time for episode 192 of the Fandom Zone as we discuss proper preparation and planning, the three Ps. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have more boys to talk about. Got to find out what the Homelander is up to and and that storm front. She's a shady one. Mm -hmm. So, everybody, we'll see you next time right here on the Phantom Zone podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Ciao.